Uh, nice to see you here today. I'm sure all of you have many other interesting things to do to keep you busy. Uh, so I want to talk about the fourth phase of water. And um, <clears throat> Ingmar mentioned a book. And of course, we all know the three phases of water. One, two, three at the bottom, uh, uh, solid, liquid, and vapor. And I'm going to talk about the fourth one that is described in this recent book. Now, I think most, most people would, would think that water, since water is the, the most common substance on, on the face of the earth, and everybody, it's everywhere, that everything about water must be known already. So what's interesting, why, why should we begin studying it? I want to start with three examples that I hope will demonstrate to you that we really don't know uh, a lot about water. And so here's the first one. This is very simple, uh, cloud sitting above the water. You probably never gave it a whole lot of thought. The question is, how come, how come only one cloud sometimes, or two or three, when the water is rising all over? Uh, why shouldn't there be a, a continuous cloud always over the water? So something is going on. Uh, somehow this, this cloud seems to be maybe attracting the rising moisture or something. Okay, and here's another one that it's not so clear. You drop water on water, and here's what happens. If you drop it the right way from the right distance, and look at this last droplet. You see how it, what it does? It goes through a series of, uh, of reductions and, and then co we, you know, everybody thinks that, that water meeting water will coalesce instantly, but that's not, not the case. And here's another one from Elmar Fuchs. And again, it's very simple demonstration. You just take two beakers, put them lip to lip, fill them with water, stick two electrodes in, put on high voltage, and here's what happens. So first you get a bridge between the two, but then if you pull one beaker from the second beaker, the surprise is that the, the bridge doesn't break. It continues and you can extend it up to four centimeters approximately and it persists in, indefinitely. Now, this is just water. You've never seen a demonstration like this in water, I don't think. And how, how do you explain this? So, these three were presented as teasers, just to show you that there are some things about water that are not at all uh, clear. So we, uh, we started um, to get in, into water. Again, it was from, from muscle contraction, biological motion. If you read about it in the textbooks, the word water hardly appears. It would be as though the proteins involved are working in a vacuum instead of in water, but obviously it works in water. This book, inspired by a fellow named Gilbert Ling, who's now 94 and who's written now his sixth book on the subject about water inside the cell and the idea that, that water is not like water in a glass, it's organized in, in some way. That was the inspiration. I wrote this book, 2001. It talked about the gel-like nature of the cell, and most critically, it talked about the role of water in the cell. And the evidence convinced me that uh, water is actually, is not just something that bathes the important molecules of life, but water is central. It participates in everything that the cell does. And that was the, the main message of this book. Now, fr from this, out of this came the following concept that, you know, the cells are filled with proteins and other macromolecules so densely packed that there's not really room for a whole lot of water, but the, the cell is roughly two-thirds th water, depending on, on the cell type. The idea is that with all these, these protein surfaces inside the cell, most of the water in, is right near one or another of the surfaces, and if it's right nearby, it's influenced by the charges on the surface, and therefore the water molecules, shown here as dipoles, uh, plus minus, ought to line up somehow, and the textbook version is that maybe one or two layers of water line up, but we argued, based on a lot of evidence, that it's more than that, that this ordering of water could stand out, extend out to quite a few molecular layers. All you need is about 10 layers, and that will basically fill the cell because the cell is so crowded with proteins. So basically, most of the cell has this kind of ordered water. But we didn't know how far these molecules could extend or what are the properties of this. But there was one feature that, that 
seem to repeat itself over and over in that this is kind of like if you have ordered water, it's a bit like a crystal. And crystals, for example, ice, as, it, as they form, they exclude particles and solutes. And therefore, we knew that this kind of water would exclude. And therefore, we took this clue to try to find out more about the water. We came upon a very simple uh, preparation to demonstrate it, and that is what you see here. So you see a gel on the left. The gel is put into a chamber. And the idea is, is you put some water right next to it, and uh, water plus some kind of particles. And these particles ought to be excluded. These are microspheres, by the way, one micrometer spheres. They ought to be excluded from some region. If the molecules of water are lined up from, let's say, from here to here, then we'd expect that these particles would be excluded from this region. And you can see that there is some exclusion. If you do this as a function of time, it surprised us because as, as soon as you put the microspheres and water next to the gel, it looked as though the gel was pushing these spheres away. This zone would grow, and here you can see it grew to about 50 or so micrometers, pretty large uh, uh, in, in terms of relative to the size of the, of the water molecule. So we saw this again and again, and someone suggested that since this zone, um, this clear zone excluded, why not call it the exclusion zone, or EZ, or EZ, whatever. So we call it the exclusion uh, zone. Now I want to show you, here's another example of a completely different type of material. This is Nafion. Nafion is like, like uh, uh, Teflon, except that it has a lot of charge groups uh, in it. And it comes in sheets. You can very simply, you take a sheet and you cut it to any desired shape that you like, and you plunk the sheet down in the chamber, as you see here, uh, and you add water and microspheres and see what happens. Well, what happens is this, the same thing. Uh, this polymer does the same thing as the gel. And in this case, it actually extends out to approximately, typically, four or 500 micrometers, half a millimeter. You don't even need a microscope to see it. You can see it with your naked eye. Very simple. Well, those are just two examples. By now, this basic finding has been confirmed by this is a part of a list, probably 20 or 30 different laboratories. And in fact, we were rather chagrined to find that it had been done 45 years ago and published in the Journal of Physiology by Green and Otori, who were looking at, at eye lens uh, uh, tissue and cornea. And they found the same thing, even the same size. So there's nothing new here. So there isn't really much doubt that these exclusion zones exist, but the question is, what, what do they really mean? And that's what I want to talk about today. Is this phenomenon general, or just those two slides I showed? Does it really arise from water ordering or something else? And if it's ordering, can we explain those first three slides and more? Uh, what energy creates the order? You can't get order without, without energy. You can think about cleaning your room. You know, your, your room gets messy and sloppy over time, and it takes some energy to put that room back into order. And might these findings apply more broadly? And I think the last answer is very much so, and we'll get to that. OK, generality. So first of all, what surfaces create these zones? So we tried many gels, maybe 15 or 20 of them, uh, hydrogels, gels made of water, polymers of various sort, biological surfaces, and even monolayers single molecular layers put onto gold, functionalized in certain ways, and, and, and these build exclusion zones, even single molecular layers, so they act kind of like a, a template. What's excluded? We've seen particles up 50 micrometers in size or so, down to tiny particles, down to molecules, and down to molecules molecular weight 100 or lower. I want to show you just one example to show you uh, some small molecular weight dyes. We use pH sensitive dyes. So these are dyes the same as, you know, litmus paper. They're a dyes, a mixture of chemicals approximately molecular weight, 100 or so, and they change color depending on the pH. Okay, they come in soluble form. So, so what we do is we take a piece of naphion or some other surface, we have an exclusion zone, we put the dye in the water and see what happens. And here's what happens. So at the bottom you see naphion, 
piece of naphion in the chamber. And all the pretty rainbow is the first thing that you see, but please ignore that for the moment. What you should pay attention to is the exclusion zone next to the naphion. It's clear, you can see right through it, and the dye molecules are therefore excluded, and their molecular weight roughly 100 or so. So it looks like molecular weight 100 is, is excluded. And we actually have evidence even that water is excluded. I won't go into that, but because the experiment is a little complicated. But it looks like the exclusion zone excludes almost, almost everything. Uh, we'll go into the reasons why. But if you look at the color distribution, the, according to the chart that comes from the company, the red color means uh, pH of three or less. Now, three, pH three means a huge concentration of protons, so, and then fewer and fewer as you go farther away from, from the interface here. So, in terms of generality, uh, many hydrophilic surfaces not hydrophobic, not surfaces where the water beads up, only hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones. It seems to be almost a characteristic of hydrophilic surfaces, and many solutes are excluded. Now, okay, question two, is the zone that we're talking about, is it really water or is something different, the property is different from, from water? And uh, I want to present to you the evidence that it's indeed different from water. And, I'm not going to go through the evidence uh, in detail, although I'll go through one piece of evidence in detail, because otherwise I'd use up the whole hour. But I'm just going to list these, uh, and it's all published. So um, we found that the easy water molecules are more constrained than the bulk water molecules outside of the exclusion zone. We found that the molecules are more stable uh, using infrared radiation coming from there, or very little radiation coming from that zone compared to bulk water. It has negative charge, and I'll go into that in a moment. I'll show you the evidence for that. It absorbs light in the UV at 270 nanometers. Uh, bulk water doesn't do that. It's more viscous than bulk water, almost like raw egg white. The molecules inside are aligned from birefringence me measurements. And the molecular structure is different from, from ordinary water. And, and, and finally, actually it's not final, we have one, one more, but, but uh, um, two Russian groups, both from Moscow, studied the optical properties of the exclusion zone. And they don't even know each other, but they got the same result published last year. They measured the refractive index, and it was 10% higher than that of, or 11% higher than that of, of bulk water. Uh, the same result from, from two labs. And there's, there's that, it means the EZ is more dense than bulk water. And there's an eighth one, I just neglected to, to include it here. The EZ fluoresces, and the water doesn't fluoresce. So it's vastly different. Now, what about the negative charge? How do we establish that? Because it's really important. So where it says inside, it means it's the inside of a, a gel. Uh, initially, it's a polyacrylic acid gel. So that's the, the blue here. And outside is where there's water. So here is the interface. This is where the exclusion zone ought to be. And we want to check the electrical properties of the exclusion zone. So how do you do that? Well, you take two electrodes. And we put one electrode out here somewhere, the neutral electrode. And we use the second electrode as a probe. And we went from point to point. These are microelectrodes. They taper down to uh, uh, less than one micrometer. It's kind of the Ling-Girard microelectrode. And so at first, if you're far from this interface, then the potential difference between here and here is zero. And that's reassuring, because that's what you expect. We didn't really expect too much, but we found that as we got roughly a couple of hundred micrometers away from, from, the, uh, from the interface, we began to pick up a negative electrical potential. It went down to about this level. And that corresponds roughly, the negativity corresponds roughly to the extent of the exclusion zone. And then we rip out the gel and we replace it by naphion and we repeat the measurement. That's the one that's shown here. I mentioned to you that for naphion, we have big exclusion zones. Uh, 400, 500, sometimes even 600 micrometers. And you can see that the measurement repeated for Nafion shows that the negativity starts farther from the interface and gets more negative. So from these measurements, we concluded that the exclusion zone is negatively charged. Now, that sounds impossible. 
It sounds impossible because if you think about the simplicity of the experiment, we take a gel and we put it in the chamber and then we dump in water and the water is neutral. So how is it possible that you dump in neutral water and from the neutral water somehow you get a big negatively charged zone? It confuses. Well, the only reasonable possibility is that what's going on is that the water molecules are splitting into negative and positive uh, portions. And somehow the negative ones are somehow uh, in, in this region, and the positive ones must be elsewhere, like maybe out here or something like that. But is there any evidence for a positive region together with this negative region? You've seen it. You've seen this slide, it's turned 90 degrees to correspond to the last one, and you can see that next to the nafion, the exclusion zone, is negative. I just showed you the evidence for that. And remember the colors, the red color means very low pH. We've actually seen in some cases pH 1 next to some, some gels. So you have a negative region and a positive region, so it, it does appear that somehow the water molecule is being split into negative and, and positive uh, uh, portions. But just to make sure that we're not deluding ourselves into thinking about something that's really not there, we took two electrodes. We put one in the positive region, one in the negative region, and we connected the two through a resistor to see if there's current flow between positive and negative. And you can see the current starts at some high level and goes down to to some uh, plateau value, which is not zero. It maintains this for some time. So you do get current flow between positive and negative, so it looks like there really is charge separation going on from negative to positive. So essentially we've got a charged battery in water. You have the, the uh, material here, uh, the water, is this easy water is negative and the region beyond is positive, and you can draw current from it. So I wanted to, to um, affirm that this EZ is not neutral, it has negative charge. If you look at the blue uh, aspects, uh, the molecules are aligned and they're stable and they're constrained, what's that characteristic of? Well, it's characteristic of a liquid crystal. So it looks as though you have some kind of a liquid crystal structure in that zone that's different from ordinary H2O. Okay, so, so far I've suggested to you that next to hydrophilic surfaces, like proteins, but it doesn't matter what kind of hydrophilic surface, uh, we have a liquid crystalline region, it has negative charge, it excludes solutes profoundly, and I'll show in, in a moment that it may not be a series of stacked dipoles as I argued in the previous book and many other people have suggested, it's something different and I'll explain why, and it may extend very far from the interface. So how far is very far? The textbook says a couple of hundred micrometers, a couple of hundred, uh, sorry, suggests uh, a couple of molecular layers, but w we actually find uh, a few million molecular layers if what I've shown you is correct. It was suggested a hundred years ago that water has a fourth phase, not just three phase, some kind of interfacial phase. And I, I, I mean, I don't know if this qualifies, but all of the list of properties I've shown you are, are different from, from ordinary water. This is bounded, it responds to pressure and temperature, just the way phases do, and there's a lot of it. So I think perhaps this is what the embodiment of what Sir William Hardy suggested a century ago, that water does have a fourth phase. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at the evidence, you know, all of us, we, we like to look at evidence from the past six months or one year, sometimes two years, uh, if we're conscientious. This is 1949. It's a review article from a guy from Stanford University. I'm sorry about the, the quality uh, of it. It lists more than 100 references before, obviously, before 1949 that show that when, when liquids meet solids, something dramatic happens. It's not just water, but many other liquids too. And um, in his review, right on the front page, he talks about hundreds of microns in depth. Depth means, the, I, we, we say width, he says depth. Something changes over a very broad scale. Many publications demonstrating this, but all of this has been forgotten. So again, I emphasize what I've shown you so far is nothing new. Okay, so what about the uh, non-dipolar uh, issue? Why am I suggesting that, that 
that something is wrong with dipoles, we measured negative charge. Dipoles are neutral. If you stack dipoles from here to the moon, you'll never get a negative charge out of something that's neutral. So that's wrong. I mean, we were wrong in thinking that it's a stack of dipoles. Also, this absorption that I, met, I mentioned at 270 nanometer, usually that's characteristic not of dipoles, but of ring-like structures with delocalized electrons. And so for, for these two reasons, especially the first, um, we need something else. So, so what could the structure of this zone be? Um, well, you know, you can start from many different vantage points to figure out what the structure is. And we thought an important one is to look for something, look for some precedent. So what, what structure of water do we know for sure? Well, we don't really know much about vapor, and liquid water is, is, is complicated, but ice. See, the structure of ice is well known because it's so regular that you can do diffraction and figure it out. And this is what ice looks like. So if you look on the left side, the red ones are oxygens, and the hydrogens are just missing to keep it simple. I'll show you them in the next slide, but they fit right in, or a few slides away. They fit here, here, and so on, halfway between the oxygens. So what strikes you is that, is that the hexagons, there are sheets of hexagons, and all the hexagons are nicely in register. Okay, that, that's the basic structure. Now, if you look at the same structure from a different angle that's shown on the right, you, you kind of lose sight of the hexagonality uh, of it, but you can see these blue dots. Okay, so, so what are the blue dots? So the blue dots are protons, positive. They glue together the two negative oxygens, and that's why ice is hard. Now, so we thought, Maybe some variation, we want a structure for the exclusion zone, maybe it could be some variation on ice. And we thought, cleverly we thought, all we need to do is to remove those blue protons, you see, and then we start with a neutral structure and we remove the positive and we get something that's negative, right? And, and, and also, since we remove the glue, it's not solid anymore and we want something that's not solid. So we thought we had a a lead on getting the answer until someone tapped us on the shoulder and says, you're wrong. And why are we wrong? Because this structure, unfortunately, is unstable. If you, if you remove the positive charge, then you've got two negatives next to uh, one another, and the structure will fly apart. So good try, but doesn't work. So after a few weeks of, of depression, <laughs> uh, an idea struck, and the idea is, is, is shown here. So now I show you two layers, and I, we've restored the protons. You can see that they're sitting here right in between the two oxygens. And the idea is to shift the layer closest to you to the right. If you do that by half of the oxygen-oxygen distance, then you have something that looks interesting because you see the negative oxygen behind sticks to the positive proton in front, and so you have electrostatic attractions between the two layers. So, and it appears at, at one third of the location. So, so you have some weak glue that holds them together, and you still have the negative charge because you removed the protons from the ice structure. So this looks like something that, that actually works, and, and we can imagine it like this. So we have a hydrophilic material here, and uh, it's sitting in water, and from the water builds these easy layers, the first, second, third, and so on. And, and, and so, so these are hexagons, they're roughly m maybe, I mean, they're, they're uh, fractions of a nanometer, really small, and each one is displaced from the one behind it. So if you try to penetrate through there, the openings are really tiny. So you get this buildup. I mean, so it's no surprise that not much can get in, that everything practically is excluded. And they build up one by one like that. And this is, uh, shows you what, what the structure is of one, one of those layers. Now, the surprise, maybe it's not a surprise, if you count in the unit cell the number of oxygens and hydrogens, of course you expect, well, it must be H2O. But it's not H2O, it turns out it's H3O2. It makes sense because, you know, H2O is neutral, or H4O2, or H6O3. So the one on the bottom, the H3O2, would be neutral if it had H4O2, but we don't want it neutral. We want it negative because this is a negatively charged zone. So, 
it isn't surprising that there are not enough hydrogens to make it neutral. So this is the, the chemical formula, you might say, of this. Now, to achieve that, we've shifted one plane to the right. And you see, by shifting, we get this nice lineup of minus plus and minus plus, and, and it sticks. Actually, it doesn't stick so tightly if you were to, to apply enough shear to these. If you apply a little shear, it will come back. But if you apply a lot of shear, then just like egg white, if you apply enough shear, it flows. And that would be the, that would be the properties of this. But we moved it to the right. Now, I could have moved it to the left and gotten the same result because it's symmetrical. Or I could have moved it 90 deg uh, 60 degrees or 120 degrees and gotten the same result. So why is that important? It's important because uh, you can get interesting structures. So here is layer 0. Layer 1 is shifted by 0 degrees, then 60 degrees, 120 degrees, and you get a helix. So why is a helix important? Well, as many of you know, most of the biological molecules are helical, right? The nucleic acids are helical, proteins, many of the proteins, fibrous proteins are helical. And it's known that uh, these structures, um, helical structures, um, are surrounded by some kind of ordered water, at least a few layers of it. And so you can imagine, for example, the DNA sitting right next to this water. It conforms. That's a positive feature. See, the advantages of this non-dipolar exclusion zone, it has precedent, it has negative charge, which we need. The ring-like structures uh, account for the 270 nanometer absorption. It's able to accommodate helical structures. So, you know, I think it has many advantages, and you might say, well, yeah, but is it ever seen? And the answer is yes, it's seen. There are many papers that show uh, hexagonal type of structures interfacing with various solids, but most of them deal only with one or two molecular layers. But this is the exception uh, that I'm going to show you. It's done by a Harvard group published in 2008, and they studied a protein, actually a subunit, subunit C of ATP synthase. It's a very ancient protein. And one of the functions of this uh, protein, or, or of the subunit, is to form enclosures that trap water inside. So if it's dry, they protect, protect from evaporation. So these structures here are filled with water. Um, here's another example. Sometimes they form spheres, and other times they, they form geometric kinds of volumes. But they contain, uh, this one will contain millions of water molecules, this one hundreds of thousands or so, smaller. So the question is, what's the structure of these? Well, they did electron diffraction to see the structure of the water. And what they found surprised them, uh, those of you who know diffraction patterns, you can see two features. First is that these dots, these diffraction dots, are very sharp. Sharp dots mean order. Fuzzy dots mean no order. These are really sharp. So the volume of stuff inside is, is ordered. And the second is that these are hexagonal. So they concluded that the water inside consists of ordered hexagonal sheets, which is what I'm suggesting. So yes, there's some evidence. Uh, we'd like to look for more evidence. But it appears uh, the answer to question two, is it really physically distinct from the bulk? Yes, it's distinct. And it looks like um, a layered honeycomb structure. OK, so we have a kind of liquid crystalline water that has this honeycomb feature. Can, can, can crystalline water explain those counterintuitive uh, anomalies? What do we expect from a crystal? Well, the first is that any of you who have played with crystals, like salt crystal, sugar crystal, no, they stick together. It doesn't come apart. And so you might think now, what about gelatin dessert? So gelatin dessert is. 95% water. I've handled gels uh, from Osada's lab in, in Japan that are 99.95% water. It's all water, essentially, with a few strands of polymer somehow holding it together. Now, there are osmotic arguments for this, but when you deal with gels that are 99.95% water, it's hard to invoke those, those arguments. Uh, the, the question is, why doesn't the water just dribble out if you have so much water inside the gel. You hold it up, and the water should just, just dribble, but it doesn't. And so, um, so if you look inside a gel, um, th this is kind of a computerized version of the, of the structure. And the yellow stuff are polymer strands or, or protein strands. 
And you can see there are gaping holes or gaps in, inside the structure. And, um, and that's where the liquid is inside those gaps. And those gaps can be much larger than what, what you see here. So the question is, what, why doesn't the water just flow out? And, but, so the reason, I believe, is that these are hydrophilic surfaces. And the hydrophilic surfaces create layers of easy water that stick to one another and stick to the surface, just as I've shown you. And so um, because it's filled with easy water, uh, it stays. It doesn't leak out. Also, when you feel a gel, you know, it feels like, it feels kind of gel-like. It has this peculiar consistency. And sometimes you might ask yourself, well, why does it feel that way? And uh, I think it feels that way because the water, this easy water, has gel-like properties. And so, okay. So now here's another, another phenomenon. As you know, if you take a paper clip or a coin or whatever, and you slip it beneath the surface, it falls to the bottom. But if you carefully place it on the surface, uh, then it will stay, even though it's more dense than the water. And what's the reason for this? Well, you might say, I know the answer to that one. It's surface tension. So what's surface tension? Well, the usual understanding of surface tension is that you got water molecules, and they like to stick to one another by hydrogen bonding. But the guys on top have nothing to hydrogen bond with up there, right? And so the potential hydrogen bond flips down and makes a bond with other water molecules. So you, you get a, a layer that's, that's stiffer, somewhat stiffer. The question is whether a single molecular layer, a few angstroms thick, is enough to, to explain this. And uh, being a bit skeptical, we began to study water at, at the, or what happens at the air-water interface. And we found that this kind of water that I've been talking about grows at the air-water interface. And it's a very simple experiment. You just take two sheets of glass and, and seal them around the edges to make a chamber. That's shown here. And so here is the air. Here is the uh, meniscus. And here is the water and microsphere. It's cloudy, you see. And we found that after 10 or 15, 20 minutes, a clear zone develops. It's roughly a millimeter or so thick. And it stays. It's stable for, for as much as uh, a day or so, after which time all of the microsphere sediment to the bottom, for reasons which are not entirely clear to anybody, actually. But anyway, we have this zone, this clear zone, a clear zone is similar to an EZ because it ex excludes microspheres. We did uh, measurements using microelectrodes, and we found that this upper zone, especially near the top, has a negative electrical potential. Again, expected. And I'm going to show you that in the next slide that this, this clear zone is not water. It's like a thick gel. It's cohesive. It sticks together despite mechanical perturbations. And so, so here's a similar picture. Here are the microspheres in water. And here is the, um, the clear zone. And what we're going to show you is that when you take this probe, touch the surface, put mechanical force on it, that the thickness of this zone doesn't it changes hardly at all. And here's, here's, so it comes down. It lifts up. You can see that. The thickness doesn't change, and uh, so it looks cohesive. It's like a long rubber band sitting from the left side to the right side. And so it looks like the reason you can float a paper clip or a coin or what have you is that it's not just one molecular layer. It looks like many structured layers create the high surface tension that we know of. And that explains, um, perhaps some of you have seen this. This is a lizard. It's from Central America, I think Costa Rica. And um, it sits on the tree branch, but it often jumps from the tree branch and walks on the water. So because it's called the so-called Jesus Christ lizard, uh, commonly, because it walks on the water. And the question is, well, why, how can it walk on the water? And I think you, you know that there's a thick layer. It's not just one molecular layer. And then we go back to, to the droplet falling on the water. So, if you have H2O and H2O, it ought to coalesce instantly. But we really don't have that. We have, sitting at the top of this, the air-water interface is an exclusion zone, a thick exclusion zone. And the pendant droplet exposed to the air also has an exclusion zone. So when one drops on the other, it's not water meeting water. It's easy water meeting easy water. Whoops. And, and you can see, actually, what happens. So it drops, 
it stays and it undergoes this kind of dance. This is reported a hundred years ago. Nothing new about this. We just decided to make a film because it's fun to make films like this. It's quite predictable. Sometimes this will stay for up to 15 or 20 seconds. And you can see them, in fact, in, if you're out on a sailboat or something and you look in the water and it's raining, or just after the rain, it's sitting on the boat's gunnels and, and drops into the water, it stays for quite a long time. I never could believe it until a student of mine says, just keep your eyes open and look. And I, now I see it all the time. Crystals can be pretty stiff. Okay, you know, I mentioned the salt or sugar crystals and especially diamonds, rubies, whatever, they're crystals. So when you look at this picture of the water bridge, you can calculate the stiffness. A paper just appeared in a physics journal a week or two ago. They measured the amount of droop here. And from the droop and knowing the dimensions, you can compute the stiffness. It's extraordinarily high. You can almost kind of walk across it. And um, so how do you explain this? Well, H2O has no such properties, but you can imagine if this is crystalline uh, water, EZ water, under the right conditions, the, this EZ could be quite stiff, and then you can explain it. Okay, finally in this series, um, um, we have something paradoxical. You have a negative region next to a positive region, and anybody who studied physics knows that when you put negative next to positive, they want to do this, annihilate one another. That doesn't happen here because we know if we put one electrode in here and one electrode here, we measure a potential difference, it persists for days. How's that possible? Well, it's possible because the structure, I mentioned to you, the structure has openings uh, that are really small. And these, these are actually hydronium ions, a proton stuck to water bigger than water molecule, even though it wants to penetrate, it's too big, so it stays out. So the battery charge remains separated. So the answer to the third question is yes, liquid crystalline water explains many anomalies. It explains why the water battery charges remain separated. Okay, so the $64 question is um, what charges the water battery? You know, everybody turned off their cell phones but if you turn them on again, battery runs down and you need to stick it into the receptacle to charge it. And so every battery needs to be charged somehow. And the question is, this is a battery, right? It separates charge and you can get current flow from it just the same way that your cell phone battery gets current. So you have to charge it up. And where does the energy come from? Well, we scratched our head for a few years until we realized that it was light. So the experiment, the first experiment, looked like this. So we had the chamber sitting on a table like this. And a student took a lamp and walked by and shined the lamp on the preparation. And lo and behold, this is an actual picture um, here. This is not. But so here's a piece of naphion. It was sitting next to an exclusion zone and microspheres. And we shined the light, or he shined the light. And what happened is the illuminated region, the exclusion zone expanded, it grew. And then if you took the light away over tens of minutes, eventually it went back to the original control value, which you, which you see here. So we did many experiments. Uh, this gave us a clue that, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that if you, if you shine light and it gets bigger, then maybe light is somehow responsible for the growth to begin with and the separation of charge. So we found that we looked at many different wavelengths. Uh, I, I, I don't want to show the data um, because it's just too much, but we found that the most powerful is actually is infrared wavelengths. Now, so you might ask a question, same question that I would have asked at some stage. Well, where do you get infrared light? Do you need to turn on a, a toaster or a, a stove or something like that, that glowing red to get infrared light? And the answer is no. Um, if I were to turn off all the visible light in this room and whip out my infrared camera and take a picture of you, it, I get a beautiful image of you, of the chairs, uh, of the ceiling, the walls, whatever. Everything is generating infrared light. Otherwise, I couldn't get an image. It's all generating infrared light. So it's kind of like this. Uh, and it's free. It's free for the technique because it's always there. And this is the energy 
that's responsible for separating charge and building this interfacial zone. So it's kind of something like this. You have a material, you have easy water that's built from the ambient infrared. And if you put more infrared or more light, just infrared is the most powerful, it just builds up. And if you to remove the X-ray, it goes down back to the control. We've seen exclusion zones grow by 10 times by putting light and leaving for a long enough time. So now we thought, well, gee, it's nice. We know that if you add light, especially infrared, other wavelengths work, but infrared is the most important. If you add it, the exclusion zone builds. But what happens if you reduce it? So for a while, we couldn't figure out, well, how do we reduce the ambient infrared? The typical response is, well, you go to absolute zero, but it's kind of cold. So, um, so we, and, and, you know, living in Seattle, we figured, ah, Seattle is the home of Starbucks. So, and, and, you know, in the summertime, if you have a cold drink and you put it in one of these containers, it stays cold. So why does it stay cold? It stays cold because it blocks the infrared from outside from coming in. So the idea arose, just take one of these containers and put the chamber inside and see what happens to the exclusion zone because you're blocking infrared. Of course, we didn't use this container. We used a professional doer from the physics department in which, if you like, you could put liquid nitrogen and it stays liquid because it keeps out the infrared which would tend to uh, vaporize. So here's the result, or a result. So we, this is the control and you can see the exclusion zone. By the way, whenever I show you a green images, there's nothing, nothing significant about that. We just use a green filter in the microscope to reduce the microscope illumination so that if we're looking at light effects, we don't want the microscope light to play a part in the result. So we minimize it by putting a green filter. So you can see the exclusion zone, and then you put it in 15 minutes in a doer, a better one than this, and you can see that the exclusion zone is reduced by roughly half. And then you take it out carefully, and after 15 minutes, it's almost back to where it was. It takes 30 minutes or something, like 35 minutes. So the answer to question four about energy is that easy buildup is powered by light, which orders the water and charges the water battery. And we see this whether you increase or decrease the amount of input energy. So you have a situation that looks kind of like this, um, a battery charged by, by the sun. So think about now what happens in the universe. Uh, you have the sun, the sun hits the water, and you can go swimming in the summertime. I've shown you what amounts to a different pathway. that uh, The sun hits the water and it imparts energy for building order and separating charge. Now we don't know whether this one is more important uh, quantitatively or this one is more important or even it's possible that there is no arrow here, that there's only one pathway creating this which then degrades into heat. Okay, so if I've got this water sitting here and this water is receiving energy from the environment, then you know, I ought to be able to capture that energy somehow. This bottle of water ought to be able to do work. But I guarantee you that nobody here has ever seen water doing work, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I mean, if the energy is coming in, you should capture it. So I'm going to give you an example of water doing work. Um, and this happened by accident. Funny, we have a lot of undergraduates in our laboratory. Um, and they're very open-minded and I always tell them if you find something interesting come come to my office and so one student came running in and he did this experiment he uh, he took a tube so nafion comes in tubular form remember that nafion nafion uh, creates an exclusion zone so there'd be an annular exclusion zone inside here and another one outside he put it in the chamber filled with water and microspheres in the water, so if something is going on, we could see, we can track movements because you can't see water moving, but you can see the debris inside the water moving. And he came in, he came, I remember he came running in and he said, you know, water is flowing constantly through the tube. That's not supposed to happen. Usually if you want to push water through a tube, you know, water, you have to supply some energy. And so what's the energy that you supply? Well, usually what you do is you, you put a pressure difference 
uh, and that pressure is used to drive it. So your heart, for example, is driving, uh, wa uh, driving blood through, through your vessels, but there's no pressure gradient here. So what, where do you get the energy? That's the interesting part, and um, we know, of course, that this is absorbing energy from outside. So let me show you uh, what, how the experiment is done. So you take a piece of tubing and you fill it with water inside, make sure there are no, uh, no bubbles. This doesn't work with Teflon, by the way, but it does work with Nafion and many others. So you can see she's putting it, it's in the water, putting it in the microscope, and then if you look, this is what happens. So you have the Nafion here, the exclusion zone next to Nafion, and here's where all the microspheres are, it just keeps flowing. And we've seen examples of flow that goes continuously for a day and a half. It just keeps going. Here's another example. We've tried it not only with Nafion, but initially with this gel, and in fact now with eight or nine different gels, and we get the same result. And the way we do it is really simple. We form the gel, and we form it with a, a piece of wire. And we pull out the wire as it's forming, so we have a tunnel inside the gel. So you have a gel with a tunnel, you plunk it into the water, and what you have now is exclusion zone here, exclusion zone next to, the, next to the gel, and all the microspheres are confined to this central region, and it goes like this. Again, it just keeps going. So we thought also, you know, if this is driven by light, light builds the exclusion zone, creates charge separation and such, what happens if we add more light? Um, and so we did the experiment and we found that we could increase the speed up to five times just by adding light. It's just published. Okay, so, so we basically we have a hollow tube sitting in water and we get spontaneous flow. Now to get the flow, work is done because the water has some viscosity to it and so, you know, if you have flow through a tube, work has to be done and energy is required and uh, so unless we have a perpetual motion machine, which we don't believe, there's got to be a source of energy to drive it. And I've shown you the source of energy. It's that the water is absorbing infrared and other light from around. And what happens is that energy is transduced um, into other kinds of energy. So now, of course, this seems, this must seem awfully strange that light is coming in and the light is getting converted into other kinds of energy. But it's not strange at all because if you think of the plant that sits on your windowsill, that's exactly what the plant is doing. The plant is absorbing light. Um, that's where it gets its energy. The light is converted into chemical energy and the chemical energy drives everything from metabolism, photosynthesis, uh, movement, even flow inside, inside the plant and, and bending. And I'm suggesting to you that water does the same, that it absorbs light and converts that light energy into other forms of energy just the same as the plant. And it isn't really much of a surprise because the plant is mostly water. So we wind up with the equation E equals H2O, and I know that the units don't match, but basically you have, when you have water you have energy. Why is this important? I think it could be foundational for much of science involving water, molecules, and light. And this fifth section is what I'd like to end with, and I want to give you a few examples. So, so I, we started with the idea, this kind of summarizes what I've said, in case you've forgotten. <laughs> uh, you have a charged particle or molecule in water, and around that forms a large liquid crystalline zone of easy water, and as this builds negative charge, you get positive charge out here. One comes with the other, and all of this is driven by light. Now, if you think about this process, if we're right, then this has got to play a role in all aqueous chemical reactions. And so if you think about it, you know, the reactions that we learn about in, in the textbook don't take into account any of this. And if it's true and if it occurs, then you know, we, we have to step back and reconsider uh, many of the interpretation of many of those reactions. Okay, so here's one, one of those, you might say. What you see is two negatively charged particles, so 
So I'm saying, well, you know, you take, you take one from here, one from here, they're both negatively charged, and you drop them into a beaker, and the beaker contains water, so they land in the water, right near each other. They're both negatively charged. Okay, so I ask one brave soul to tell me what they think happens. These two are like charged, they're near each other, they feel each other's charge, you have two like charged entities, what happens to the distance between them? Growing. Pardon? Growing. Growing, right, okay, the answer is the opposite. Thank you. <laughs> now this is a paradox, but this is not from our laboratory, although we repeated this many times and have a lot of information. It started with Irving Langmuir, or even before him, a physical chemist, important enough that a journal is named in his honor. Okay, and he, was, he observed this and he was talking about it, this paradox, and even Richard Feynman, the great a physicist, a Nobel physicist, also talked about it in his lectures, and he called it like likes like. So what does that mean? Well, these are like charged, and they like each other, so they come together, right? Because they like each other in his own inimitable way. So they start coming closer and closer, and, um, oh, let me just go back a step. He said, like likes like because of an intermediate of unlike. In other words, there have got to be positive charges here to pull the negatives. But it, until, until this, it wasn't clear where those positive charges came from. Now you can see where the positive charges come from. As the EZ builds up, you get positive charges. And in this region, you get contributions from this one and from this one, and therefore the concentration is highest in the center, and therefore these two will move toward one another. They'll keep moving until a certain point. And that, at that point, they're stable when the attractive force, those positives pulling the negative, is equal to the repulsive force between these two. Then you have stability. So the principle, the like-like-likes principle, has actually been known for 10 centuries. It started from the tale of Genji, in fact, who described two warring parties, and they'll never get together. The only way they can get together is if you put the unlike in between. Uh, then then uh, very easily they come together. And this is really an embodiment of that principle. It's like, likes, like because of an intermediate of unlike. And so you have a situation like this. And this is known, this is a colloid crystal. And it works in this same way. This was actually found by many people, uh, including Norio Ise, who got the highest Japanese prize, which was dinner with the emperor for this, this discovery and elaboration. It's not really a discovery, but he did m many uh, classical observations. So the particles stick together, or they come together because of like, likes, like. And if you had yogurt this morning for breakfast, the consistency of yogurt probably arises, it's a colloidal suspension, uh, because of a situation like this. And if you think about it, this is actually a self-assembly principle. All you need is particles, water, and light to drive it, and you have automatic self-assembly. So important for biology, where molecules are pumped out, of the ribosomes, and they have to self-assemble into something, into filaments or uh, vesicles or something, and it's not at all clear how that happens. This is a very simple principle that might apply. It also might apply at the origin of life, because whenever that happened, <laughs> Somehow, you can imagine the Earth is full of molecules of some sort. We know what they are. And somehow, they have to come together to form something, a, a blob of some sort. Otherwise, you can't have a cell. Well, how do these magically come together? This is a very simple process that could play a role in self-assembly in step one in the origin of life. Light, water, molecules. Um, and now we come back to the cloud and we ask, well, you know, how, how is this possible because the water is evaporating all over? How is it possible to get only, say, one cloud? And I think it's actually quite simple because, you know, those droplets that form the cloud, so-called aerosol droplets, they all have negative charge. And probably you'd guess that if you have these negatively charged droplets in the air, they'd repel each other. But that's wrong, because otherwise, if they repel each other, you'd never get a cloud. And the reason you get a cloud, I believe, 
is because the atmosphere is well known to be full of positive charges. So you have these positive charges. If you have enough of them, they basically glue these negatively charged vessels together into a condensation called a cloud. If you have another one here, for example, this positive charge will attract it and come and the cloud will build. Okay. Um, now, does biology use radiant energy? So, so, you know, bacteria photosynthesize. They use radiant energy. Plants do it. They use radiant energy. And the question is, if you were Mother Nature and you were inventing animals and you and, and me, would you take this principle and apply it? Or would you just discard it because it's too primitive? Um, well, you know, you can come up with your own answer. I mean, the question is, see, we receive radiant energy all the time. I'm sorry, no genitals. I, <laughs> I was not responsible for this one. But uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> so you, you, you receive the energy. And so there are really two options. One is you can discard it. And the other is you could use it. So how might we use, if, if at all, do you think we might use it? Well, one of the things is that it, the vascular system is all over the place, and there are lots of vessels that are not too far from the surface of our bodies. Actually, light can penetrate pretty far. You know, maybe some of you saw when you were kids, you, you were dark adapted, you took uh, a hand and you shine a flashlight through, and you can actually see it coming through the other side. So <laughs> it's got to penetrate something that's this thick. In fact, uh, there's an imaging method that's been developed where you take a light in the infrared region, 0 0.8 micrometers, you shine it through the skull into the brain, it gets scattered, it comes back through the skull into the sensor and you can get an image of the brain. So it's got to penetrate, some wavelengths have got to penetrate really deeply. So do we use that or not? Well, I began my career studying the cardiovascular system and I was quite satisfied with the idea that the heart is pumping and it pumps it into the aorta and the small vessels, no doubt about it, it all works fairly well. But someone reminded me that there's a problem with the capillaries. So the capillaries, to my chagrin, are actually smaller in diameter in healthy young people than the red blood cells that have to pass through them. It looks like Mother Nature screwed up. I mean, if you were an engineer and you invented a pipe, would you make the pipe diameter smaller than like the football that you have to squeeze through? There's a lot of resistance created by this. It just, something is, is, is amiss. Obviously there's a purpose that Mother Nature had for doing it. It's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But my Russian cal colleagues calculated the resistance, calculated the resistance of these vessels, and they computed that if the heart were responsible fully for driving the blood through the capillaries, no problem with the large vessels, through the capillaries, the heart would need to develop a million times the pressure that it develops. This was a shock to me, and even if they're off by three orders of magnitude, still, this is a real problem. So the heart needs some kind of assist to get the stuff through the capillaries. And this is an example, so this is muscle tissue. I'm gonna show you a video, and you can see a capillary here and here. And here's another one with a red blood cell, so squeezed because it's a really tiny capillary. And this is what the red blood cell should look like. Reminds me of pictures taken by Leonard Nielsen. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, and, and so, so here's, here's the video. You can see they all squinch down to get through. It's not so simple to, to do that. And if you look at the guy in the middle, he's having real problem getting, getting through there. So <coughs> the question is, is the heart doing this? In which case you'd see pulse, 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 but you don't actually see that. Is something else helping? Now I wouldn't have suggested this except that I've shown you that if you have a hollow tube, just like a capillary, in water, just like the tissue around it, you get spontaneous flow because of the absorbed radiant energy. You see, and so we absorb radiant energy all the time and it is possible that the same thing that I'm showing you in this slide happens in our blood vessels. Might radiant energy help drive blood flow? And we're studying this right now. We don't know if it's true or not. We're testing it. However, a really interesting paper came out um, of, uh, from an Israeli group three years ago studying blood flow in mice. 
So he was using optical coherence tomography. Some of you may know that method. It's a way of penetrating deep into tissues and being able to resolve things that are pretty deep, which is a real, real advance. And they were looking at blood flow in mice. And I don't remember exactly what their purpose was, but they were maybe using some drugs or something. And after the experiment was over, they sacrificed the mice. They cut off, closed, clamped the aorta, and, and, and the mouse duly complied by dying. However, they were still making the measurement of blood flow, and they noticed that after the heart stopped, the blood kept flowing in the capillaries. And they were astonished to find this. They carried out the measurement for, and they found that it lasted for at least one hour. And then they tried it again in one mouse after another. And every one of the 10 specimens got the same result. The blood flow continued for an hour or more. So this is, uh, this is very <laughs> puzzling, enticing, interesting. How could the blood keep flowing if the heart stopped beating? Well, it raises a suggestion that maybe energy flowing in, especially since they're using an optical technique, they were pumping in lots of light. Perhaps that's responsible. So I'm not suggesting uh, that we, we photosynthesize, uh, but I am uh, suggesting that because photosynthesis has about 20 steps and they're very complicated and uh, maybe we do, but at least we use light in something of the same way. We absorb light all the time. So if you think of this, uh, even at the cellular level, so our, our cells are absorbing light. So what does the light do? The light builds easy water in our cells. Our cells are therefore full of easy water. In fact, the cell is so crowded, so tightly packed, that most of, the, most of the water in your cells and my cells is actually easy water, not bulk water. And that's what my previous book was, was about. Now think about the implications. And this is fairly new to us, uh, the implications. The easy water is negative. Well, all biologists know that the cell is negative. Right? If you stick an electrode into a cell, you get minus 80, minus 90 and millivolts. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think about because, because why is the cell negative? Well, we know there's a theory, and that has to do with the membrane and with the pumps and channels in the membrane. But oddly enough, we now have water that's negatively charged. And the question is, well, is it really the pumps and channels that are supposed to be here? It's very unlikely because we have experiments where we can remove the membrane and still get a sizable membrane potential. And we've studied many gels, and so have others. No membrane. You stick an electrode in, and you get minus 100 millivolts, minus 150 millivolts, just like a cell, but no membrane. So in the past year or two, I've come to start thinking that the main reason that the cell is negatively charged is because the water is negatively charged. It turns out that in sick cells, like cancer cells or kidney cells, the cells are less negative. They were minus 30 millivolts, 20 millivolts. And I started my career doing, uh, sticking electrodes into cells. And we always knew when the, when the so-called membrane potential, when the electrical potential went from minus 80 or something down to minus 20, that cell was dying. And other people have confirmed this sort of thing. So it looks like sick cells have less easy water. And the remedy, obviously, is to give water. So probably your grandmother told you when you were sick, you had some problem, drink a lot of water. And this idea has come down from centuries of experience. And I will recommend to you a book. It's called, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. This was written by an Iranian guy while in prison, a uh, political prisoner. His name starts with Batman. <laughs> it's easy for us to, but it's a very long name. And he had experience treating prisoners because he was the only physician. All he had available was water. It turned out, he told them to drink a lot of water, and then whatever they had seemed to disappear. This book has sold more than a million copies, by the way. Um, and, and then he studied this in his medical career after he got out of uh, prison. And it's really impressive. It's not clinical trials the way we would do them, but he's describing experience with patients. So one chapter deals with kidney problems, one chapter with diabetes, one chapter with cancer, and all of these drink more water. And he got amazing results. And we know now that various types of water 
are better at hydrating the cell, bigging, b building up this, this negative charge and we would like to, to study objectively which ones, which waters are better. This one maybe or spring water or we don't know that. So just think about you go outside into a sunny day and you feel good. So most of us think, well, it's obviously a psychological reaction. But I'd like to suggest to you, it might be, but it's also a physiological reaction because you get the, the sunlight, you get the light, the light builds up easy water throughout your body and whatever is deficient in easy water and not working so well, perhaps a muscle ache or a headache, whatever, you'll feel, you'll feel better. And the same thing with heat and the same thing with the sauna. I noticed that my hotel has one, it's very nice and I know in this country a lot of people enjoy it. So, you know, you go and you sweat you feel rotten and you walk out of there and you feel like a million dollars. Everything feels good. Why is that? I think it's, uh, it's very simple that all of these wavelengths, heat, light, build exclusion zones and separate charge. The cell becomes more negative. And of course you get potential energy because you're separating uh, charge. So this is energizing and that's why you may feel new, new energy. So this should promote function and restore health. So I guess the, the, the sort of question that arises is, well, can we live on light? Now obviously we can't. However, it's not so clear. So maybe some of you are acquainted with, with this guy. Um, he's one of actually many. This is Prahad Jani. He's from India. One day he walked into the local Indian government and he told them, that he hasn't eaten anything or drunk anything, in fact, it's very humid there, for 65 years. Now again, that's preposterous. Nobody could ever believe that he could do that. Um, and so he was tested by a physician. Um, they put him in the hospital in a sealed room. Actually, there were 15 physicians. There was a physiologist, a pulmonologist, a psychologist, every ologist you could think of in this group of 15. And they examined him for two weeks and they reported and certified that this guy didn't eat anything and didn't drink anything also, actually, for, for that period of time. They performed every conceivable physiological experiment on him. They even checked his bladder, which was getting bigger and then smaller and bigger, but he didn't urinate. And the guy who, who was in charge of the team of physicians who studied him told me, we got to know each other, he said after it was over, after two weeks, they had to go upstairs and this guy would run up the stairs faster than he could run up the stairs. So I'm not sure about this, but this is the evidence that we have. There are actually many such people. There's another one by Michael Werner. He's a professional chemist. He's head of a research director of some institute. Uh, he's German, but I think this is in Switzerland. He wrote a book about eight years ago, Life from Light. Now he doesn't know anything about light and certainly didn't know anything because we hadn't published anything when, when he wrote it, but as a chemist, he said, you know, he worked his way down to two glasses of juice per day. That's all. He said he's never been healthier. He plays tennis, he makes love, he does everything, feels good. And um, he thought, he thinks somehow, uh, he does some meditation, and he thinks that he gets his, his, uh, his energy from light. And I presented to you a possible way that this could happen by absorbing the light, building your energy, building easy water in, in your water in your cells. And there's a second one that just came out in English by Straubinger, and um, he's Austrian. It's a film, a video, in the beginning there was light. Again, light seems to be the overwhelming theme. These are many people interviewed who claim they don't eat. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is an interesting. Okay, I end with a couple of practical applications because everybody likes practical applications. And so the, the most obvious one is getting energy from sunlight and water. So we have a surface here, we have easy water and negative and positive charge. You put an electrode here and an electrode here and of course you get electrical energy out of it. I showed you that. Of course the amount of energy you can get out, sticking two tiny electrodes pretty small. And we're working on trying to see whether we can extract so much more energy from this than we've been able to extract. We don't know, but it's promising. In this way, it's basically a photovoltaic cell, but instead of depleting the earth of its valuable minerals, we just use water and light. 
The second one is getting drinking water from contaminated water. So here's a hydrophilic material like naphion or gel or what have you, and you, next to it you put contaminated water with bacteria, toxins, what have you, and you know the, uh, they're all excluded. And so if you collect the exclusion zone water, it should be not only free of all this contamination, but it's the same water that fills your cells and it should be able to hydrate very nicely and perhaps promote good health. So we can extract it right now, but the amount that we can extract is enough to maybe satisfy the thirst of a flea. We need to improve it, and we're working on that as well. We think salt is excluded. We're not sure if salt is excluded. Then we can put ocean water here and get drinking water out of it using not the huge amount of energy that's now required, but using the energy from the sun to do the separation. All of these separations are done from free, basically free energy. Okay, so the main conclusions um, are, uh, I showed you that, you know, we, 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 all of us think that there's ice and liquid water and vapor, and I, I provided the evidence that there is a fourth phase. You can call it a fourth phase, you can call it what you like, but there's something here that to the best of our understanding is a honeycomb sheet-like structure with sheets uh, building up with a structure that looks pretty much like ice, but not exactly ice. It's ice minus protons. I put it in between the ice and the water because we found, no time to describe it, that if water is converted into ice, a necessary condition is it must pass through the EZ phase to get there. And we also found, there's a paper just published, if you melt ice, the melted ice doesn't go directly to water, it goes to EZ, and then the EZ goes to water. So this is a critical phase for understanding how ice forms and how ice melts. Okay, so this is a sort of main point. The consequences of these, these observations are actually quite a few. So the central finding is that the water is not at equilibrium with the environment. Your chemistry and physics textbook says that a water sitting here is treated as though it's in equilibrium with the environment. It's out of equilibrium. It's constantly absorbing energy and converting it, and therefore it acts like a motor, like an engine, converting one to another. And so you think about the consequences. I've discussed a, a couple of possible biological consequences. I mentioned to you that in chemistry, if any of this stuff is close to being right, then then we, we need to pay attention to fresh interpretations of some of the stuff in the chemistry book that I thought was pretty complicated to understand and maybe it will become simpler. I'm not sure, but it needs consideration. The weather, you know, we watch the, uh, the weatherman on, or woman on, on, on TV and they talk about, well, the temperature is increasing and there's a pressure drop and blah, blah, blah. I think that more important than the minuscule variations of pressure throughout the atmosphere is charge. The atmosphere is full of charge. Charges are so powerful and I think it will become clear that, um, that the charges in the atmosphere, especially in the clouds and around the clouds, critically important, of course, you know, charges have got to be responsible for this, critically important for understanding the weather. I've talked about health and the idea that the water inside your cell, the easy water, if you don't have enough of it, your proteins can't function because all the proteins have easy water around them and they all bend or twist or whatever. And for protein folding, the proteins don't fold in a vacuum, they fold in water, around easy water. If you don't have enough of it, they won't fold properly and your, your cells can't function. If you want to preserve food or freeze it, uh, um, freeze dry it, you gotta know about the water. The water is absolutely central to, to food. I've given you some practical applications like filtration, uh, maybe desalination, and certainly getting electricity uh, from, from water. So all of this is described in, in the book that's now been out for a few months, and if anybody is interested, I have a few flyers here. Uh, as, as you like, you can actually download some free chapters and read them if you like. So I, I think I'll end here, and uh, thank you for being such good listeners. Thank you. Okay.